Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We're not really starting yet. We still got a little bit of time, but we're going to get kind of warmed up together really quick. And so someone told me this morning, there's someone in this church that has a birthday today, and she's 94 years old. I won't tell you who or where she is, Miss Joyce, but she said, I heard that she loves this song. So before we even start, let's all, we're not going to sing happy birthday. We're going to sing this song to her. Ready? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Y'all sing it for him. All fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he is all right i'm gonna sing this next verse for her okay let me let me get another key let me get in a real key i did that one for y'all god sent his son they call him jesus he came to love heal and he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives y'all help me because he lives I can face tomorrow Happy birthday, Miss Joyce. All right, I'm going to let you have a seat. We're going to start in the baptismal waters right here. You welcome our children's pastor, Mr. Ken, today. Come on, let's give him the encouragement this morning. Good morning. Today we have the joy to baptize four children. And so... Hello, my name is Austin, A.J. Rodriguez. Good job. Okay, A.J. has the confidence that if he were to die today, he would spend eternity in heaven. If he were to die today and God were to ask him, why should I let you into heaven? He says, I'm saved from sin because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He says, since I received Christ, now that Jesus is in my heart, I will follow him. AJ, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus and him alone for your salvation? Yes. Do you desire to follow him as your Lord? Yes. Okay. AJ, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, as uh, your Savior and Lord, it is my joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, risen to walk in the newness of life. Hi, my name is Junior Hunsaker, and I've accepted Christ. Very good. Junior has the confidence that if he were to die today, he would spend eternity in heaven. If he were to stand before God and God were to say, why should I let you into heaven? He says, because Jesus died for me so I can have forgiveness of my sins. And he also says, I want to live eternal life with you and be a servant of yours. 
when, when he thinks about this important event, he remembers Pastor Ken pulling me out of children's church and talking to me about God's free gift of grace and what it means to accept it. He says, I remember the verse Pastor Ken taught me, Romans 6, um, 20, 33, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Since I received Christ, I see God's hand at work changing me and equipping me for his service in the following ways. God has worked in my life in the smallest ways, like helping me show my emotions better. He has worked in, in me in the largest ways, by, like giving me a family that has helped me become a better version of myself. Some of the people who the Lord used to bring me to Christ are my mom, dad, my teachers in children's church, and God himself. So, Junior, have you put your faith in Jesus and him alone for your salvation? Yes. Do you desire to follow him as your Lord? Yes. All right. Junior, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is my joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, risen to walk in the newness of life. We have two more children that are going to get baptized. Um, pastor Guadalupe, he's our um, pastor for our Hispanic ministry. He's going to baptize one child. And then Chris Jasper is going to have the privilege of baptizing um, his daughter. Good morning, everyone. I am very excited for this baptism. Uh, let me introduce Lennox Trinity Santana. She's now 10 years old. Lennox is part of the Grace, the homeschool group that meets here on Mondays. Lennox accepted Jesus on March 26 at nine years old. This is what, San it, it, this is what Lennox wants to share with all of you. What Lennox remember about the day is playing with her friend, Nicholas Brooks. Lennox asked Nicholas about, about baptism, and Nicholas explained, explained to her that the baptism was a confess of her faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Lennox says, I remember Nicholas tell me that Baptist was not just getting dunked. <laughs> he said it's one way more than that. Nicholas says that before getting baptized, I need to admit and I am, I am a sinner. Ask God to forgive, forgive me and, and believe and confess Jesus, uh, Jesus and sacrifice for my sins. Then I could be baptized to show every, everyone my faith in Jesus. That night, after my parents put me to bed, I go up and pray to God. And I said, God, I know I am a sinner. Please for, forgive, forgive me of my sins. I said, Jesus, after praying, I feel something special. I feel... God forgive me my sins. Since I asked Jesus into my heart, I have been, I have been way nicer, especially to my brothers. <laughs> I am very thankful to God for my friend Nicholas because he led me to Jesus. Well, uh, the whole Brooks family led me to, to Christ because they kept inviting me, invite me to church, invite me to church, and they would bring, bring me to church sometimes. They made, they made me want to learn more about the God. But my friend Nicholas, he def, def, definitely, definitely told told me about salvation. She said, she said that Nicholas, his brother, his friend Nicholas, he was the, the main kid for show, show her the way for the salvation. So, Lennox, 
you uh, has confessed your faith on Jesus Christ, like your Lord and, sa and Savior, right? Yes. Okay, for me, it's a privilege to baptize you. Um, baptize you today in the name of the Father, in the name of the Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I have the uh, very special privilege of baptizing my daughter this morning. And so, it's, yeah, super excited. And uh, she is an answer to prayer. We've been praying for her before she was born, and uh, just like our other daughters. And so um, she's my third daughter to baptize, and the Lord is faithful. He answers prayers. And so if, uh, if your children haven't made a profession of faith, continue praying for them. And uh, God, God, trust God that he'll answer your prayers. All right. And so he answered our prayers. And so, Shiloh, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to make him Lord of your life? Yes. Based off your profession of faith, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Wonderful. Let's stand together as we're going to sing an opening song. Then our pastor will come and greet you. Then we'll continue with our worship. So here we go. One, two. Sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all Take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who leads us forth and a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Who like the sun in all of its brilliance? The King of glory, the King of all. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my Thank you. 
amazing grace. Come on, church. As we the sound that saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was When we been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the Father, a hand. That's good singing. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Michael. As you were singing that song, I was hearing the congregation. I thought, how wonderful heaven is going to be. Voices in tune and all together. I say in tune because mine's not now, but it will be. Amen. That's my, that's my uh, hope in Christ that I can be able to sing. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you know this. Uh, if you don't, let me just say it again. Every week we pray for guests to join us, and every week God answers that prayer. I've had the privilege to meet some of you. Some of you are here for the baptism. By the way, wasn't that wonderful? Amen. And uh, it, it's a great illustration of what God's doing in our church. We uh, Simultaneously to this service, we have two other services going on. Pastor Guadalupe and I, he uh, teaches in Spanish. And Brother Ken, who started the baptism, he preaches in children. <laughs> and that's a whole different language sometimes, and you know that it is. Uh, but we see all of that come together as one church with one uh, hope in Christ. Amen. And trying to uh, tell the world there is a Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. And celebrating His resurrection every Sunday here. So thank you uh, for being a part of this. In the pew near you, there's a guest card. If you would uh, take some time to fill out information about yourself, uh, out these doors, Mike and Kim will be there to meet you following the service. We have a gift we want to give you, and it's just a, a way of us expressing thanks to you. Uh, we ask for information because we want to connect with you and have you uh, better understand how to connect with us here. Thank you so much for being here today and being a part of this service. Uh, we're excited about all that God is doing here. And we just want to say thank you for that. Let's pray together. Father, as we continue in our praise as part of our worship before you today, Lord, we thank you for these beautiful testimonies given by these children. How special, how wonderful it is, Lord, that uh, the gospel is so simple a child can understand and so profound that even the most educated doesn't totally get it without the Spirit of God working in their mind and heart. I ask, oh, Holy Spirit of God, that you would anoint our time as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we lift up our voices to you, Lord, your word tells us that you inhabit the praise of your people, Lord. I pray that we would sense your very manifested presence of God among us today. Bless our choir, bless our praise team as they lead us in our worship time, Lord. I pray that you would be exalted above all other names that your will would be done in my heart, in our hearts today, in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Let's stand together and continue to worship. Like a bride waiting for her groom will be the church that's ready for you. Every heart that's longing for our King we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, even so come, Lord Jesus. All of creation. 
creation All of the earth Makes straight a highway A path for the Lord Jesus is coming soon Call back the sinner Wake up the saints Let every nation Shout of your fame Jesus is coming soon. All right, take a deep breath and sing this with us. Here we go. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church that's ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we see even so come, Lord Jesus. God, we wait, you're coming soon, so we wait, we wait for you, are you ready for that day? God, we wait, you're coming Somebody say amen to that. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. Intro.
to the prison. Sing it with Mike. I poured shackles and chains, but I've Woo! been Come on. freed and forgiven. Yes, I have. I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. That's why. see boys and girls I think we need to worship a little bit right here is that okay if you're tired of standing you're welcome to sit down but if you want to worship and stand up you continue that okay listen there is a blood that cost a life it paid my way death is price when it flowed down from the cross, my sins were gone, my sins forgot. Amen? Come on. There is a grave, and it tried to hide oh, this precious blood. That gave me life, but in three days he breathed again, and he rose to stand in my defense. So I come to tell.
Give your father a hand. Thank you for worshiping today. Pastor, come on. We'll have a seat and let the choir be dismissed. Wow. What a blessing. Thank you so much, choir. Praise band, Michael. I appreciate all of you so much. Thank the Lord for you. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to look at several passages of Scripture today. Romans chapter 12. I'm in a series. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, we begin by talking about what does Pentecost Sunday mean? Why, why is that uh, not celebrated maybe as it should be? Or why should it be celebrated? We talked about that. Then we talked about uh, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? And then we talked about what does it mean to be an ambassador of Christ? And today... I want to talk about what does it mean knowing God's will for your life? What does that mean? Does God have a will for everyone? Have you ever wished, like I have, <laughs> that you could open the Bible and point to the scripture and read God's will for your life? Yeah. I've wished that. Or better still, if you could hear a voice from heaven telling you and explaining you in complete detail what he wanted you to do. <laughs> Every area of your life. We all want to know God's plan. We all want to go, know God's purpose for our life. Uh, and uh, he has a plan and purpose for our life. Can you say amen to that? And the Bible uh, helps us to understand that he uh, had that plan and purpose for your life and for my life from our very conception uh, he, he made us for a reason. He loves us more than we could imagine. He cares about every detail of our life. The Bible says that, that this, this scripture just blows me away. I don't know why, but it's so profound to me that he, he doesn't know how many hair on your head. He has them numbered, the Bible says. Detail. And he knows for me, number 872 and 921, that went down the drain this morning in the shower. Uh, he knows about every detail of her life. And uh, I can't tell you God's detailed plan for your life, but today as your pastor and someone I, I, I truly do care and love about you, I, I want to help you get to the position that you can draw from God to see what he wants you to see about his life. Now, if that's going to happen, it's going to require a new way of seeing. Uh, we, we have to begin by thinking about God's, God's way of thinking uh, and seeing from God's perspective. And I mean about, about God, about ourself, about people that are around us, about our potential and, and the possibilities of our life. That we, you and I are to be living with a sense of destiny about our life because God has such a plan that uh, we, he has a destiny for us to, to live out in our life <clears throat> and to see some things that we can only do in life. And finding God's will for our life then requires us to see and think differently. And that's what the Apostle Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, is talking about in Romans chapter 12. Look at the first couple of verses with me and we'll be referring to other passages later. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, here it is, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know that God, you can know God's will? God's will is not some secret that he's hiding from you. It's not like when you're playing kids, uh, uh, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you're getting... No, there's a, there's a plan that God has, and he wants you to know his will. He wants me to know his will for my life. Now, the Good News translation, it reads like this. Uh, Let God transform you inwardly. See, it starts on the inside. By a complete change of your mind, then you'll be able to know the will of God. God uh, has a will. Paul says that you'll be able to know the will of God when you have a change of mind. So you can just read that, that backwards, and it basically says you can know the will of God if you have a changed mind. You can't, have, you can't know the will of God if you don't have a changed mind, he said. Because he wants to change the way you and I think about things. For example, if you're facing a decision or a challenge and you're trying to decide why you should do about a, a certain thing you're facing in your life, uh, what is your default position on that? Do you, do you start with, with a position of doubt or do you start with a position of hope and of faith? See, it's about how we go into it thinking about it. The way we think has such power in our life. Does it start with uh, a fear about certain things or uh, is it a peace about those things? Is your first thought, well, I'd kind of like to do that, but I, I know I could never do that. Or is it, you know what, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, it's, it's the way that we think. God wants us to change that, that preset or the process of our thinking. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, be made, new, uh, be made new in attitude of your mind. You know, I was always taught attitude is everything in our life. And it really does affect everything about our life. Be made new in the attitude of your mind. When, when I know God... Uh, and when I know what God's Word says about ethics, for example, well, then it makes it easier to discern His will in the area where my ethics is being challenged. Or uh, when you know what God thinks about morality and what God's Word says about morality, it makes it easier to discern God's will in decisions that we're making that has to do with our behavioral choices in life. But if I don't know what God says about a certain thing, then I don't understand how God thinks about a certain thing. But when I read what God says about it and understand how God thinks about those things, then it impacts my attitude toward those things. Am I making any sense to you? Because I want to make sense today. Uh, to do that, we, we have to know that God, uh, what God has already said about a certain thing. You, you have to know God's Word. Uh, the Bible does not t simply tell you what God says, but it reveals to us how God thinks. Amen. God's Word is not just to inform us, but God's Word is to literally transform our life, to change the way we think about things, our perspective about everything in life. And, and that's one of the problems wrong in our culture today. They are leaning on their own understanding, not on God's understanding. And so, uh, they're, they're listening to what culture says and not what Christ says. And so, if I'm just listening to what culture says, then it's going to affect my attitude toward everything that's going on around me. And I'm not getting on a, a uh, bandwagon about that today, but you know what I'm talking about is true. We, we in our country have lost our way largely because uh, we have lost God's perspective we no longer consider what God thinks about it. We no longer consider what God's Word says about it. So how do I know the will of God? I want you to take your outline, if you don't mind, and just follow me along these uh, ideas, this thought as it's developed. Uh, number one, reading the Bible is reading God's mind. 
Uh, have you ever said, you know, I wish I could read so-and-so's mind? Well, you know what? You can read God's mind because reading the Word of God literally is reading God's mind. And you know, that's, that's true in every relationship. For example, the more you talk to someone, and guys, listen to them. <laughs> the better you're going to understand how that person thinks. And if you understand how they think, you understand better how they feel about things. And of course, that's true in every relationship. Every couple would, would uh, give testimony uh, that the more I listen, the more I understand what's going on in the other person's life. A as you learn to tune in, uh, to hear what God says in His Word the better you're going to understand how God thinks about everything in our life. Uh, you have to listen to what God says. We want God, and here's the problem. You and I want God to give us the big picture of his will all at once. God, just, just lay it out for me. That, that's what uh, most of us, I would say, would, would say that we want. However, God reveals his will slowly to us, one step at a time. He usually uses closed doors and open doors. Uh, I have a, a verse of scripture that's become one of my uh, favorite scriptures. I refer to often, it's in uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. And listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 4, uh, verse 18. It says, the path of the righteous as like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. When I was uh, coming over here this morning, I, I was looking at the sky, and, and at first the, there was just an a, a orange glow at the horizon. And as I drove over here, uh, that orange glow turned brighter and brighter. And all of a sudden, I saw the sun. And then all of a sudden, the sun is up and uh, everything is illuminated around it. And that's what Bible, the Bible says about the way, he, he, the way of the righteous. And if we're Christians, we're what? We're righteous people. He said, the way of the righteous is like the first gleam of the dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. It, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's God uh, showing his, his self to us, revealing his will to us. It's not like it's just full blown, just, and, and, and uh, it, it's obvious. Uh, it, it comes to us like, well, here's what I want to say, point C. Uh, God's will dawns on us. It dawns on us. And God has open doors and closed doors. Now, here's the problem with open and closed doors. Sometimes you get stuck in the hallway <laughs> between the closed door and the open door. And the hallways is what miserable in our life, right? Uh, because uh, one door hasn't opened, another door seems to be closed. The first gleam of dawn is, is a very faint glow. The sun uh, hasn't even come up yet, but you're beginning to see that something is happening. Something real is happening. And you can, you can see something that's about to change. And then the light illuminates our side. That's how God's will is. It becomes obvious, more obvious to us as we go through our life. So uh, here's what I have in my notes. God's will for me and for my life, God's will for you and your life, is not necessarily a, a destination, but rather it is a way of life. Now, this is a profound lesson that God has had to teach me uh, over the years. Because when I, I started out, uh, I was reading every book I could. How do you know God's will? How do you know God's will? And there's a lot of great insight that I was given. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, God's will is not a destination, but that's what we want. God, show me what job you want to have, and then put me in that job. Show me who you want me to marry, and then put me in that relationship, etc. But that's not how that God's will works in our life. And there's a biblical illustration of that. Uh, we, we, we're focused on how we are living, location, activities, etc. But God is focused on the way that we are living. Uh, if, if it were just a destination, then uh, we'd be going from place to place with no thought about even getting there. Isn't that right? Uh, no thought about even getting there. For example, uh, I use the example of Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. 
God shows up in Abraham's life. And he says, leave your country, leave your people, your father's household, and go to a land that, that I will show you. He didn't even tell him what the destination was. He said, I just want you to get up and go. I want you to go this way. <laughs> and I'm going to show you a land uh, that I, I want you to have. I want you to uh, leave your old life and have a new life. I have a new life, God says, in mind for you. Uh, I want you to leave your old values I want you to leave your old ways, your old gods. You know, uh, the ancestries of Abraham worshipped a plurality plurality of gods. But God wanted to show him that there wasn't a plurality of gods. There was one God. And he said, I want you to leave that whole idea, all those concepts that you've been taught. God honored his, his life because he was willing to trust God and follow him. Now listen, did Abraham mess up in his life? Well, absolutely Abraham messed up in his life. There were many mistakes that Abraham made. But, but God says, Abraham is my what? He's my friend. And he is following me. Following God with your life, following God's will, doesn't mean you're never going to mess up. How many of you can say amen to that? Doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes, but it does mean this. If you're following God with your heart, that God says, I love you And I care about everything. And so when you fall, I'm going to faithfully redirect your life. He's going to redirect your life. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6 it says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. How do I know God's, how do I acknowledge God? In all your ways acknowledge God and he will direct your path. How do I do that? Well, by seeking God's will in all of our decisions. Not some of our decisions. But in all of our decisions, asking God, what do you have to say about this? One of our deacons recently said, you know, the answer to every problem is to open the Word of God and just see what God's Word says. Let God's Word say what God's Word says. That'll be God's will for our life. Asking God, what do you have to say about this thing? Notice it doesn't say, uh, acknowledge God in some of your ways. Acknowledge God, I'm going to acknowledge you over here in the spiritual area of my life, but I'm not necessarily going to acknowledge you over here in the secular part of my life. Well, you're not going to know God's will because uh, uh, you're going to get confused. It includes ways when you really feel like you know what you should do and when you really don't think. (laughs) It's amazing. When we really feel like we know what we should do, well, uh, we just assume that's God's will. That not necessarily is God's will. I've been wrong about a lot of things in my life, and so have you. Uh, it, it, it includes ways when you, uh, whether you feel like it or not, in all of your ways, seek God's mind, the Bible says, and He will direct your paths. Now, I think that's a very important word, your paths. It doesn't say, I will lead you and show you the ultimate destination in full detail. It says, I will lead you in the what? I forgot already. Path. I'll lead you in the path. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's that verse, Proverbs 3, verse 6, out of the New Living Testament. So here's the key. The way, the way concerning God's will is more important than the destination that you want to go to. And and here's the question. Did you arrive there through obedience to God or did you arrive there through compromise? Jesus in Mark chapter 8 verse 36 said this. What good is it for our men to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now, here's a question. Do you believe you are living the way God wants you to live in your life? By that, I mean your values, your morals, your godliness. Is your path drawing you closer to God or is it taking you away from God? Is it bringing you into a more intimate relationship with God? I'm talking about your way, your path that you're on. Or is it taking you away from a less intimacy uh, with God? God's path is always bringing you closer to Him. If you're drifting away from God, 
I want to tell you, you're not on God's path. If you're becoming indifferent to the things of God, then you're not on God's path. Uh, God is not going to bless you if you're not willing to do what he says. I was reading a commentary about Abraham's journey. I haven't uh, been there and I haven't measured the wall markers, but the commentary says this was 500 miles that Abraham walked from where God called him in the Ur of the Chaldees all the way to uh, where Jerusalem is. 500 miles. And those wasn't easy miles. I mean, he, it wasn't like he, he got in a Land Rover and, and uh, drove over there. Uh, he had to walk all the way. And there was conflict continually in his life. So I want you to write this down. Second of all, uh, knowing, knowing the destination may seem counterproductive in your life. And a lot of people go, well, I, I've been following the will of God, but I mean... How could it be so hard if it's God's will? I was talking to uh, a Christian this week, and they said, Brother Charlie, I don't understand. I don't understand. Is God, is God chastising me? Am I going through this? And I said to this lady, I said, you, everybody has a story, something like yours. It may not be your exact thing, but every one of us is going through difficult times. Would you agree with that? And, and every one of us would go, well, you know, I'm trying to follow God's will. But if it's God's will, why, why am I having all the problems that I'm, ha- I'm having? And so uh, it was true of Abraham. Abraham was going to be a father of a great nation. They didn't have any children. Now, Abraham's uh, in, in, in the, the late years of his life, nearly 100, and uh, there's no children. So uh, Abraham and Sarah discussed this, and they said, let's help God out. Because certainly, uh, certainly if you're going to be a father of a great nation, we better get on with that because uh, time is running out. But God's time is not on our time. You can say amen to that. God can do what God can do. He can do the impossible. And he did that in Abraham's life. So he suggested that, that uh, uh, Abraham uh, have a, a, a meeting with uh, Hagar, her manservant. And uh, Abraham said, well, let me pray about that. Yes, okay. <laughs> That's a joke. Y'all are not tracking with me. But they tried to help God out. Listen to me. They, they had a child and God said, that's not my will. You, this is totally not, not my plan. You messed up. You, you tried to d- take it in your own hands. But you know what? Abraham's not the only one who struggled like that. Uh, Moses argued with God about his revealed plan. Jeremiah argued with God about his revealed plan. Gideon argued with God about his revealed plan. Jonah didn't like God's plan. As a matter of fact, he didn't just argue. He, he went the opposite way from God's plan. Uh, what makes you and I any different? Just because things are hard in your life. Just because there are some situations that seem in your mind, counterproductive to what you think God wanted to do in your life doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. It might mean that you're right in the center of God's will. God's will is not always easy for us. If you knew God's entire plan, would you ever pray and seek God and have faith? You wouldn't, you wouldn't need faith. But, but God says faith is the most important thing to God. As a matter of fact... The writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, which is more important to God? You going to a certain destination in your life? Or are you learning to trust Him by faith every day of your life, no matter what the circumstances around you are? Well, I can tell you, it's, it's to have faith in God. To learn to trust God in every area of your life. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Uh, We live by faith, not by sight. Faith for this life, sight is for our afterlife. (laughs) Uh, It's trusting God. It is believing God right here, right now in my life. Biblical faith is not placed in an outcome, but in a person. Biblical faith is relational. It's me being in a relationship with God. It is believing in God's character. Now, let me ask you, 
Are you walking right now by faith or are you walking by sight? Well, I want to walk by faith, Brother Charlie, but it just, what I'm seeing doesn't seem to line up. And, and when things start lining up, well, then I can start walking by faith. But here's what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, by God's definition, in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse uh, 4, it says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. <laughs> Do you know why? Because there's never going to be a perfect condition for your life. So many of us allow ourselves to be frozen, not, not attempting anything for God, not trying to follow God in any way, because we're trapped, we're, we, are, we are frozen with uncertainty and uh, indecision. And we start talking about, well, you know, I really feel like God wanted me to do such and such, or this is where I should serve, but, or this is where I, where, where I should go, or this is what I should do with a certain thing in my life, but I don't even know where to begin. Well, how do you move forward in faith when you're uncertain? I want to talk about that just for a moment. And the reason I want to talk about it is because all of us have a tendency to get frozen in place and never to have faith, to trust God, to step out in faith. You've heard that term before, step out in faith, to go forward with the uh, inclinations that God has placed in your heart. And God does put inclinations in our heart, right? That, that's, we, we hear in the Word of God some things that we're supposed to do. Well, here's some suggestions that I've learned. Uh, number one, uh, how do I move forward in faith when there is uncertainty? Uh, number one, look for signposts. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, you get where you want to go uh, when, if, if I'm going to get to where I want to go then I have to know first of all where I am right now <laughs> took me a while to get that out but that's what I was trying to say uh, how do I get there so uh, Michael calls me he said brother Charlie uh, how do I get to such and such place my first question would be to Michael would go well I don't know where are you right <laughs> Where are you right now? Because that, that determines everything about the answer that's going to come. So, if, if I want to go somewhere uh, and how to get there, uh, I have to know where I am. Now, you, you have to look at your successes and failures in life. They're signposts. You know, I talk about this all the time. Some years ago, uh, I was reading one of Rick Warren's books, and, and he had an acrostic uh, for how God made us, shape, S-H-A-P-E, that represents an acrostic, uh, our spiritual gift, a heart for ministry, certain abilities that we have, a personality that's ours, and a lifetime of experience. Rick in his book says that, that God uses the, our shape to help determine who we are. And what his purpose and what his plan is for our life. If God made you a certain way. With certain abilities. He obviously wants to use those certain abilities in your life. Uh, opportunities that's going to come for you to participate. In his will is going to be in accord with that. If a sister church uh, uh, didn't have a, a minister of music. And uh, y'all were done with me here. And uh, how many of you think I could put my resume in there and probably get hired as a minister of music? You don't have to be mean about it. <laughs> because that's not my shape. You understand that, right? That, that's not the gifts and abilities that God has placed in, into my life. Uh, but when I have those gifts and abilities, they're, they're, they're signposts. How did God make you? Uh, what, what, do you, what do you feel like you do that is comfortable for you, that, uh, that brings a uh, feeling of, of uh, accomplishment in your life? Years ago, I think it's 1960s or 70s, there was a movie that came out, Chariots of God. Some, some of you uh, might remember that. And uh, the movie was about a missionary by the name of Eric um, uh, Little, Eric Little. And, you know, he, he ran, and he was going to run in the Olympics, and that's where his testimony all came out, through the Olympics. And his sister asked him one time, why, why do you run? 
And he says, because God made me fast. <laughs> and when I run, I, I feel the smile of God on my life. You don't have to be Eric Little to know that there are some things that you feel confident that God has just given you ability to do. And when you do that, you just sense that God has blessed you in that. Does that make sense to you? So part of knowing God's will is to know your shape. If you want to know where God wants you to be, you have to ask, where am I right now in my life? Second of all, travel light. Don't carry around uh, weight and failure from your past. Don't take that baggage with you. Uh, The Bible says, listen to this, Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols will forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But what is holding you back that making you forfeit God's grace in your life? Uh, What is it holding you back uh, uh, in your life? Well, uh, here's some things. Sinful behaviors. That's baggage that's holding you back. Hurts, habits, hang-ups. Memories from the past that... Uh, help place a, 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 an untrue identity upon your life. I've told you this story. I, I try to be transparent with my life. All my life, I've struggled with low self-esteem issues in my life. All my life. Uh, feelings of, you know, I'm not as good as, not good enough, whatever. Some of you can maybe identify with that. And I remember in high school, I, uh, I played basketball because I'm so big and tall. No, because I went to a class B school, and they didn't have a, a warm body. That's what we need. So I got to play, I got to play basketball. I was six men. Uh, so in other words, I was the first guy that got, it, got in after the uh, substitution started. And I remember uh, getting, uh, falling on the court, getting my bell rung. But I got right back up, and all of a sudden, the ball's in my hands. Just like that. I mean, just, just like that. And I scored the most beautiful layup you've ever, I mean, unbelievably smooth for the wrong team. (laughs) Now, I know you laugh at that, but I'm an old man, and sometimes that's all I can see about my life. Sometimes that is a bright light that Satan wants to identify as my life. As an utter failure. And for some of you. Some of us. That can very well keep you. From even stepping out on faith. To trust that God has a destiny for you. And a plan for your life. Does that make sense? We have to leave that baggage behind. We need to grow up. Paul said it like this. When I was a child. I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things behind me. Some, some of the times we just need to grow up. We just need to grow up. Look for signposts. Travel light. Choose your traveling companions. Choose your traveling com- uh, companions. Who is it in your life that walks with God? who prays for you, who loves you. They're not trying to impress you, so they're not fearful about being honest with you about things in your life. Who encourages you? Who encourages you? I want to tell you, I I say this to my children all the time. Uh, Three most important things in your life. Friends you make, books you read, music you listen to. You say, well, you're just an old man. I'm no, I'm, I'm, it's true. Who's your traveling companions? Who is it in your life that always seems to be present when you do mess up? (laughs) Who is it? Who is those people? Who is it that seems to be always there to encourage, pick you up, uh, tell you the truth, say, not that way, this way? Who is that in your life? You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, let us spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Sometimes, in Texas, we get the word spur. 
Sometimes you just need some friends that love you enough just to stick the spur right where it belongs. And to say, that's not the way. Who derails you? Who cares less about your walk with God? The Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. And here's the fourth thing. Keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. You, you ask with your words. You seek with your heart. And you knock with your actions. You pray, God, God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? You seek wisdom by, by going to God's Word and getting godly counsel from other godly people. You, you knock by doing the right thing. Make a plan. Set goals. Step out in faith. Trust that God's going to work in your life. What will happen is over time, our prayers will start to change. There was a time in my life, uh, I was pastoring in a church in Oklahoma City. I'm from Oklahoma. And uh, I never thought I'd live anywhere else. I'm not going to bore you with a long story, but through a series of prayer meetings I was in, I'd met Dr. Chriswell. Dr. Chriswell got to know me. And Dr. Chriswell called one day and he said, uh, Lad, <laughs> I want you to come to the queenly city of Dallas. I want you to attend the best seminary in the world and I want you to work at First Baptist Dallas I thought somebody was punking me at first to be honest with you but it really was true it was Dr. Chriswell and he invited me to come uh, free scholarship and a job at First Baptist Dallas I mean like the promised land right uh, but when I got to First Baptist Dallas uh you know, Dr. Criswell says things, but Dr. Criswell wasn't in the details. So I went to the seminary. Well, he had not bothered to tell anybody at Criswell that I was free. That was a whole deal in and of itself. And it was, by the way, full scholarship. And I got that. And uh, he didn't tell the staff that I was going to come and be on staff. And so somebody just kept passing me off. And finally down to the missions department. And... Uh, Lanny Elmore, who is director of missions, uh, just like went crazy. He said, what is Dr. Crystal thinking? I now, I'm, I'm already left, resigned the church. I'm there. And uh, Mark Cutrell, who ran the shop, built everything in the service, said, uh, saw the, <laughs> the commotion. He said, what's going on? Lanny told him, and he said, come with me. You're going to work for me. Building cabinets. Not in the pulpit, not, on, not in missions, but building cabinets. Because that's what I did in my past. I knew how. I thought, well, I've missed the will of God totally. Because if it's God's will, I'd, I'd be in one of these mission churches preaching every Sunday. Or at least helping on staff in some way. Nothing. felt like God had abandoned me. I thought that this couldn't be God's will. But you know, it was God's will. I remember uh, on the, falling on my knees one day in the shop, discouraged and beaten, thinking again about that stupid layup I made for the wrong team. That's going to be the mark of my life, God. And finally, I just said, God... I want to be who you want me to be and where you want me to be. And if this is where you want me, then I will be the best cabinet man that First Baptist Dallas has ever had. And if you've taken me out of the ministry, God, that's your business. It was your call that put me there. And it'll only be you to keep me there. And I said, God, I am yours. That was like on a Thursday On Monday, I got invited to the pastor's conference by a pastor friend of mine, the Dallas Baptist Association. I sat at a table. There's where I met Walter Evans, who's a pastor at First Baptist Sunnyvale. And he said, you're the kind of guy I've been looking for. 
to be on staff, would you please come? And it led me to live out a dream. A dream come true. To see God do something that you could only explain it by. God did that. God did that. You see, it's not the destination. It's the journey. And to know God's will, I had to say to him, if it's here, then great. And God said, now then, I got something for you. When I resigned, I didn't know where I was going to go. I had no idea. I didn't know what I was going to do. I got a call about working at the uh, evangelism division, as director of church evangelism for Texas Baptist. And I, I, I said, sure. Whatever God wants, that's what I want to do. And it was because I went there, I became an interim pastor here. The second greatest gift that God ever let me have in ministry is to be serve God as pastor at Central Baptist. Now tell me when was that God's will? When was this destination right here? God's will. From the very beginning. From the very beginning. But it didn't look like it. So many times. And it's not going to look like it for your life. But if you're faithful to God, he will make the difference in your life. Because let me tell you something. God's word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. The Bible is not just a map. It's a compass to show us the direction that God wants us to go in. Okay, my time is gone. But I got to, I got to hang with me five more minutes. Because I, I just, if, if I don't, if I'm not willing to do the general will of God then don't expect God to give you the specific will. It's important. So I just have some, some things. What, what is God's general will concerning hardship? Are you going through a hardship in your life? A lot of people are. Here's, here's God's general will. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. How many things are we supposed to be giving thanks in? I, I didn't look it up in a dictionary, but I'm pretty sure that means everything. So here's a question. Are you being thankful? Or are you being resentful? Are you being thankful? If you're asking God, why, why, why? It's usually because not you're really looking for an answer. You're looking for an argument. And God's just not going to argue with you about it. What is God's will when I'm hurt by somebody? General will of God. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now here's the question. Am I holding grudges? Am I refusing to forgive? That's the general will of God. If you're not willing to do, if you're not willing to do the general will, can you expect God to give you specific things? What is God's will for the mission of my life? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you if any reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Here's a question. Am I preparing to tell my story to everybody that will hear? Am I? What is God's will concerning my daily interactions with people? Here's the general will, Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Here's the question. Can people tell that I'm a Christian just by hanging out with me? What is God's will for me in this world? Micah chapter 6 verse 8. He has shown you, O men, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Let me ask you a question. Am I living that way today? What is God's general will concerning his highest will for your life? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Question, do you love God? And do you love your neighbor? 
You see, if, if you're not doing the general will of God, how can God give you specific things about your life? The general instructions are God's guide rails. I've been praying for one of our deacons. He been driving long distances to work and back. And, and uh, I told him the other day I was praying for him. He said, boy, I need your prayer. He said, I was driving back. It was raining. And I, I, I was driving over here. But in the express lane, I looked out the corner of my eye. Here's a car flying down the way. And uh, he said he hit a sick spot. And he was just like a ping pong off the, off the rails. And he said, man, I'm sure, I'm sure glad there was some guardrails up or we'd all been in trouble. And uh, I want to tell you, I'm glad that God has some guardrails. And the general will of God is guardrails for us to keep us from falling off the road. Falling off the path that God has for us. Hearing from God begins with a desire to hear for God. Why do you want to know God's will? If it's so, you can weigh it out and decide whether or not you want to do it. Well, then you really don't want to know God's will. We often come to God with our own agendas, specific things and directions, uh, and say, God, this is what I'm going to do. I'd like for you to bless this. This is not the way of a servant. Do you know why a servant wants to know the will of his master? So it will benefit the master and not himself. The servant wants to know the specific will of the master so that he can do the job better to bless his master. They get directions so they can serve the master more effectively. The servant's question is this. Joshua chapter 5 verse 14. What message does my Lord have for his servant? God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Jesus taught it in a prayer. Thy will be done, not mine. Isn't that right? God is looking for a surrendered heart, an open heart, committed to him. You know, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles, the eye of the Lord ranges throughout the earth to strengthen those whose heart is fully committed to him. Those whose hearts are fully committed, those, those are the ones that are strengthened. God is looking for a predecision, uh, uh, pre predisposition, I'll get out in a minute, to serve him. That's what God's looking for. I just want to serve you, God. Tell me what you want me to do. It, it's not coming to God and asking for his will for our lives uh, so we can decide whether we want to do it or not. It's saying, I want your will. Reveal it to me, God. Reveal it to me. Are you waiting for God's approval for the plan of your life. Or have you already said yes. That's what I'm going to do. Regardless of what God says. That's a mark of immaturity. I want to take you back to the verse. Proverbs 4.18. The path of the righteous. Is like the first gleam of dawn. Shining ever brighter. Into the full day. That's how God's will is for your life. It's like the sunrise. Are you following me? You, you just see a glow and you think, man, I have an urge, God. I'm sensing something. I know that something to do. And then all of a sudden, this, it starts to rise and the light begins to shine and it becomes obvious to you. The Bible says, blessed are those who wait for the Lord. I love Isaiah chapter 30, verse uh, 20. He says, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Whether you turn to the right hand or to the left hand. You see, the voice of God is behind us confirming things, not in front of us revealing things. The voice is not saying, this is the destination, come to it. It's saying, this is the way, keep walking. Hey, Charlie, you're doing good. Keep walking. Yeah, yeah, you got a great job, just go to the right. Just go to the right, pal. It, it's, it, it's God's voice behind you say, keep walking, man, keep walking. And every day of my life, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, speak. Let that voice be behind me, nudging me to go to the right hand or to the left hand. Here's the key. The way is God's will for your life. The way, the path. God's will leads you to destinations. But destinations are secondary to the way 
that is concerning to God. When, when you stand before God, he isn't going to say, did you get the job that you always dreamed of? Man, that really impressed me. Or is he going to ask, did you faithfully follow me? Down dark paths, lonely paths, difficult paths? Well done. I want you to stand with me. I say this, the message went long today as if this is an unusual thing. But I want you to hear the word of God. The will of God, does it matter to God? Yes, it matters. He has a plan, He has a will for your life. His will is that you come to know Him, be in a relationship. Are you in a relationship? Do you have the testimony those four children had today? Has there been a time that you trusted Christ? He wants you to be a member of a church somewhere, be a part of His family serving. He wants you to faithfully have disciplines every day that you're meeting with Him. Are you, are you following the general guidelines so that He can give you more specific detail? I like for uh, some of you guys to come, pastors, come stand here. Kevin, I don't see Paul. He's in here maybe somewhere. Chris, Jeff, will you come stand here? I, I'm standing up here because I've been told I, I disappear when I walk down there to you guys, so... I'm short. I can't help it. But I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to come and say, God, I want your will for my life. Father, you have a plan for our life, a purpose, a destiny. But your will for our life is not the destination. It's the journey. It's the path to stay on the path, to be faithful, to follow you like Abraham, who you called a friend because you just walked together. We make mistakes, but your grace was there to cover. And it is there still today to cover us, to lift us up, to redirect us. God, I pray that you would help us respond today, what's in our heart, what, what you want us to do. Let us, let us be honest about where we are so that we can get direction from you about where you want us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you come? All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday's gone All my sins are forgiven And I've been washed by the blood And all my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone All my sins are forgiven And I've been washed by the blood Amen Thank you Michael Mike and Kim are going to be out in the foyer waiting for you. If you're a guest, especially, we want you to come by. We have a gift for you. Let me close with this blessing uh, of the Lord. It's the priestly blessing of the Old Testament. But uh, I believe God still wants to bless his people today. Do you believe that? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I pray that you'll go in peace today in the path that God has for you because the will of God is not in some destination. The will of God is in the journey walking with Him. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you and give you peace.